Kathy. Describe the founding of Carroll County. Well, the first attempts to found what is now Carroll County go all the way back to 1813, when one group of citizens thought we should have our own county. They were going to put the county seat at Uniontown and call it Union County. And they even started the first newspaper in the county to be able to promote their idea of this. But uh, obviously it didn't take at that time. And over the next couple decades, the uh, movement got stronger until by the 1830s, there were really serious considerations of creating a new county out of the western part of Baltimore County and the eastern part of Frederick County. So uh, Colonel John Longwell moved to Westminster in 1833, started a newspaper that he called the Carrolltonian, uh, and it really was uh, very strong in promotion of the idea of a new county. But it wasn't a universally popular idea, especially along what are now our borders, uh, the communities like Manchester and Liberty Town and Newmarket really had stronger ties to Frederick and to Baltimore than they did to Westminster. So the state legislature passed a bill that allowed for the creation of a new county, but only if the people who lived in the area that would be affected voted in favor of it. So there was a popular referendum on whether a new county should be created, and uh, Manchester area really voted in, against it. It was actually defeated there and in Liberty Town and Newmarket. So those two towns got to remain part of Frederick County. Uh, Manchester, unfortunately for them, had to come along and be part of Carroll County. But when the bill passed and we became an official county in on January 19th, 1837, um, they really got on board and joined in the big celebrations. There were parades and bonfires and brass bands in the streets, and everybody really got on board in supporting the new county. And um, the other smaller towns, did they um, have their own celebrations, or did they pretty much all come to Westminster and celebrate? <laughs> Most of the celebrations were held here in Westminster. It was the new county seat. Um, everybody wanted to support that and like the Manchester band came and led one of the parades and the officials from all the towns came and joined in the celebrations. Great. And then just a little bit about Mount Airy uh, ending up being split in half. Mount Airy is now split across the county line, which uh, I know sometimes confuses people. Frederick County claims it, so does Carroll County. But the earliest part of the settlement is on the Carroll County side of the line. It actually sits at the top of Pars Ridge, um, where the B&O Railroad had to make that climb up to Pars Ridge and uh, needed an equipment station at the top of the incline. So um, we do claim the earliest part of Mount Airy as part of Carroll County. And then you mentioned also before a little bit about uh, uh, Mary Sheldon. A lot of people remember those celebrations fondly, and uh, Catherine Jones Shellman, um, who was raised here in Westminster, but uh, in 1835 her family moved to Maine, and yet she still got correspondence from all her friends here. And uh, in our collection at the Historical Society, we have a wonderful letter from one of her friends that uh, lists every day and all the events that were going on. They're waiting for, as she called him, John, which is Colonel John Longwell, to come back from Annapolis with news about the event. And then she's saying, oh, last night we all ran to the window because there was a bonfire in the street. And then they heard a group marching by and they went and saw what that was. So uh, for days on end, there were big celebrations going on. Great. Um, looking back, Stepping back into time, um, Native Americans, uh, just describe, I know, I think it was said that they had pretty much left the area by the time the whites had come and settled here, but just what was their major impact on the area and some of the legacies that they've left behind? By the time uh, most of the European settlers were moving into this area, it does seem that the Native Americans had pretty much moved out of this area. and. One of their best legacies to us is all of their trails and a lot of our modern road system and a lot of how people got into the county was along those well-established Native American trails. And you can compare the maps that show their routes with our modern highways today and see that they really do correspond. Um, can you just briefly describe how the Monocacy Trail was used by the uh, Pennsylvania Germans to travel to Maryland? Many of the early settlers in Carroll County um, came actually from other states. They weren't necessarily new immigrants to this country. And many of them in the no northern part of the county came from Pennsylvania. They were Pennsylvania Germans. Uh, William Penn had been actively encouraging them to come over and settle his new colony. And uh, after spending a while in 
around Philadelphia or Lancaster. They wanted to move west, get their own land, have, have new opportunities. And so they followed what had been Indian trails um, down into the areas around Manchester or over by Tawnytown. Um, some of them even went as far west as Frederick before moving back into Carroll County from that direction. Um, and th was it called the Monocacy Trail that they followed? Monocacy Trail was one of the ones that they followed. Um, up in the northeastern corner, there was the Conewago Trail. Um, and there were other trails that actually led from the southern part up along the Patapsco River and all the way up to the Manchester area. Great. Um, <clears throat> you just talk a little bit about the Pennsylvania Germans, um, why, they why they left, what was their intent. They were actually heading to Virginia. Uh, but they stopped here. Uh, what was it that enticed them to settle here? A lot of the people who ended up settling in Carroll County were actually hoping to move further west or south, looking for new lands and new opportunities. And then they got to what's now Carroll County and discovered our wonderful forests and our good water supplies and the uh, fertile valleys that were great for raising crops and uh, the water that could power mills. And so they decided that maybe they didn't have to go any farther and that this would be a good place to stop and settle. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, describe um, just what, what they were mostly. They were farmers, millers, innkeepers, um, and were there also some Scotch-Irish in the area, but they tended to stay in the northern part of the county? Yeah. Um, the Pennsylvania Germans came down with a variety of trades. They um, tended to create little independent farms settled around small town centers. Um, so usually you would start with a store or a tavern and then other businesses would grow up around it. Um, some of them who were farmers would also make sure that their land had enough water that they could supply a mill. And then you would get other farmers growing grains growing up around them so that they could also bring their crop to the mill and have it processed. And uh, any place that you got settlements like this, you tended to get support structures. You got blacksmiths and coopers and cabinet makers and all of the other things that would create a community. And uh, even though they were primarily Pennsylvania Germans, we did get some Scots-Irish, we did get some English coming up from the Tidewater region. So uh, we sort of became a melting pot here in Carroll County. Um, and talking about the Tidewater English, um, what was it that, why did they mi migrate from south to north, more or less, um, from Anne Arundel County, I guess, and what made them come and want to settle in Carroll County? In addition to the Pennsylvania Germans, we got another movement of immigrants from the south and east coming up into Carroll County from the Tidewater. And they were really looking to be able to plant tobacco. Um, tobacco is a very hard on your soil crop and it will exhaust the soil quite quickly. So a lot of the plantations on the eastern shore um, were starting to have the soil exhaustion and they were moving up looking for new lands. And so they came up the Chesapeake and up the Patapsco and uh, followed right on up into this region. And it's really quite interesting because the southern part of the county generally had bigger land holdings than what you'll find in the northern part of the county. They were more of a self-sufficient, almost a plantation agriculture as opposed to small family farms. Um, and you really even see a difference in the architecture of the houses that are constructed in the two parts of the county. Great. Um, and with them and their plantation style, um, they brought indentured servants and slaves. Carroll County did have slaves. Uh, we are south of the Mason-Dixon line. Maryland was a slave-holding state, and there was slavery here in Carroll County. Um, even on the biggest plantations, though, they tended to be small numbers of slaves, not the large numbers that we think of in the Deep South. And uh, there were slaves throughout the county, even in these smaller areas, and some of the Pennsylvania Germans had slaves as well, though they tended to have maybe one or two slaves who were primarily house servants, or many of them developed skills, such as being carpenters or stonemasons. So um, it, it was a factor here, but it wasn't as important in our economy as it was in some other areas in the state. Um, and then the, the Quakers, uh, when did they arrive in the area? Um, and I'm not sure, did they first settle in the Monocacy settlement? if that was true, but in and around the, the uh, Union Ridge area? There was a settlement of Quakers that moved into Carroll County, and they settled near Union Bridge uh, in the middle of the, of the uh, 18th century. 
and the Quaker Meeting House is still there on the outskirts of Union Bridge, and they were anti-slavery, and uh, they got along quite well with their neighbors, despite the fact that some were slaveholders, but um, they always were sort of the center of the anti-slavery movements in Carroll County. And what was the purpose? What, what made them want to stay in this area or, or even you know, migrate to this area? Many of them arrived for the same reasons that the other groups did, looking for new economic opportunities. Um, I don't really think there was much religious persecution that they were fleeing, but Pennsylvania was a heavily Quaker state, and so many of them also, as their family farms were exhausted or uh, families tended to be large, and often the farm was left to the oldest son, and so the younger sons were almost forced to move out and find new opportunities someplace else and uh, many of them settled here in Carroll County. Um, just uh, briefly describe that the Pike, the Pike Creek Friends Meeting House was their first, their first place of worship. The Quakers built what they called the Pipe Creek Meeting House just outside Union Bridge, a, a little stone meeting house, very simple compared to what we today think of as a church. Um, there are much simpler meeting houses, and it actually still stands on the outskirts of Union Bridge, and people are amazed at how small that structure is, but uh, it's very nice that it has actually survived as one of the oldest religious buildings in Carroll County. And the, the, um, they were among the first, that the Pipe Creek area, among the first to establish schools in the 1700s? In the 18th century, there really was no public school system in Maryland, and so throughout the state, uh, people relied on private schools or homeschooling. And quite often, the Quakers, who were strong believers in uh, Bible study and individual study, uh, they would have schools right in the meeting houses or in family homes. And so a lot of the early education in the county came from them uh, and from other religious groups who started private schools. African Americans, describe how they came, how they first came to the county. Did they come as slaves? Um, You've already kind of said slavery did not mirror, slavery in the county did not mirror um, what was having on this, going on in the South. The fuzzy gray question, um, did most of them live in the southern part because of the plantation? Uh, were there any free blacks? Just kind of maybe that early history of their coming to the county. There was slavery in Carroll County, and while they were probably larger groups of slaves in the southern part of the county working on the larger farms, None of the slaveholders here in Carroll County had large numbers of slaves. They probably had a handful at best. But slavery did exist throughout the county, including among the Pennsylvania Germans. Uh, for example, Jacob Sherman, who had a house and a tavern in Westminster, he had several slaves. Uh, we know he had several who lived in the house and helped care for his grandchildren and uh, also were doing weaving. They were, had a loom house in the backyard and were doing some commercial production of yard goods, um, and we assume they also probably did some of the work over in the tavern, but he also had three male slaves that we believe were field hands working on farm property he had in other parts of the county. Um, later, by the 19th century, some of the Shrivers up at Union Mills are slave owners. Um, so even the families that you wouldn't necessarily think of um, did have some slave owning going on uh, in their family. There weren't large numbers of free African Americans in the county at that time, um, although by the time of the Civil War you do have some who have moved into the county. People often wonder why Carroll County was named the way it is, and they assume that perhaps uh, Charles Carroll lived here, or one of the Charles Carrolls lived here. Um, but in fact, it got its name because Charles Carroll of Carrollton, uh, who was from Maryland, and everybody has fond remembrances of their American history and seeing his big signature on the uh, Declaration of Independence, uh, remember him. And he was actually the last surviving signer of the Declaration of Independence. He died in 1832 at 95 years of age, and it was shortly after that that uh, the movement to found a county really got going, and so they decided that it would be appropriate to name something in Maryland after our famous signer of the Declaration of Independence. Just describe the early uh, subsistence farming that lasted until about 1800. The earliest farms in the northern part of Carroll County were really small family farms. Um, they did primarily subsistence farming, enough to support their family and maybe have enough left over to sell some of their crop to help 
buy the things that they couldn't barter for. And uh, quite often these were grain crops. Um, there were hundreds of mills all over Carroll County by the middle of the 19th century. And these early mills were a great way to turn your crop into something that would keep. You could take it over to the mill, they would grind it and turn it into flour. Quite often they would take some of the flour as payment. You didn't have to necessarily pay them cash to get it ground. And then you had flour to last you through the winter and the mill would then turn around and sell it to a bigger market, maybe Frederick or Baltimore. And uh, so it was a nice economic system. Uh, just to describe a little bit about plantations were growing tobacco. Um, how did they um, sell their, their crop? And there was a note about slaves rolling hogsheads to Baltimore for sale. One of the real cash crops in Carroll County was tobacco, which was grown in some areas of the southern part of the county. And that was one of the few where people really moved out here with the intention of growing a cash crop. Its primary market was Baltimore, and from there it got shipped off to other areas. And uh, there have been stories of perhaps the slaves rolling the casks down the road to the river landings where it would be loaded on ships and then shipped down to the ports for transshipment to Europe. Many of the towns in Carroll County got established along existing roads. For example, Westminster was laid out by a man named uh, William Winchester in 1764 who laid out 45 town lots on what he described as the main road to Baltimore. Usually you would start with a tavern and they're spaced about a day's journey apart because people would need a place to stay and in those days you could do 10 or 15 miles before you needed to stop for the night. So you'll find towns growing up at those intervals. Now some of the towns in Carroll County also were established by individuals such as Winchester who created Westminster but Raphael Tawney laid out Tawney Town and Isaac Atley, who laid out New Windsor. So those are almost what we would consider planned communities. They laid out the town lots and sold them off in a very orderly fashion. Um, some of the others don't appear until later. If you look in the southern part of the county, there aren't as many towns. And those two towns, primarily Sykesville and Mount Airy, actually grew up along the B&O Railroad. And that's because the railroad needed shops and support at specific intervals. And so when they create those, other industries grow up around them to support the workers for the railroad. Excellent. Um, just briefly talk about the first three buildings uh, that were built in Westminster, not necessarily right in 1837, the jail, um, uh, the almshouse, and the courthouse. One of the interesting things in the legislation that created the county was that the county was required to build three specific buildings. It had to build a courthouse, it had to build a jail, and it also had to build an almshouse. So it's kind of interesting to think about what the social services were, uh, that those were the three required. Now the courthouse was begun in 1838. A local businessman named Isaac Shriver donated the land, and uh, while that was a very generous thing to do, it was also very good for him because he happened to own a tavern quite nearby. And so he assumed that when everybody came to town to do business and when the court was in session, they would need a place to stay and a place to eat, and his business would do quite well. Uh, James Shellman was a local attorney, and uh, he had also been a colonel in the militia, and he actually designed the courthouse uh, as a very simple Greek revival structure. And so when the contract was let in 1838, they laid the, the cornerstone uh, for what is the courthouse that we still have today. Although it has been expanded, uh, almost immediately after it was completed, they decided to add the famous cupola, which is its most distinguishing feature. And by the 1880s, they had needed more room, so they added wings to it. And it was expanded again in 1935. But we have one of the oldest courthouses in the state, and uh, I believe it's probably the oldest one still in regular use. The second building they had to build was a jail. Uh, and I guess if you have a courthouse, you have to have a jail. And so the old stone jail was built at around the same time as the courthouse. Uh, it looks very different today. It still stands in Westminster. But uh, it originally had a large stone wall, solid wall, that went all the way around the jail yard. Uh, and that was their way of uh, enclosing the prisoners and also the gallows were within there. Uh, and they did do public executions in Maryland uh, up until the 20th century and so every county had its jail yard with its uh, gallows. 
Now, we didn't get around to building the almshouse until a little bit later. Uh, in 1852, they constructed the building that is now the Carroll County Farm Museum, and it would house families um, and also individuals who were having hard times and couldn't support themselves. Um, some of them might be older and infirm and didn't have any family to help care for them. And it was a working farm. If you were able to work, um, you were expected to go out and work and it fed the, the uh, as they call them, the inmates. Um, but if there was crops left over that could be sold, it helped to provide the financial support for the uh, almshouse. Great. Um, explain why the, um, there were early toll houses. Why were they necessary along the various roadways? And um, how did they determine what the travelers had to pay? The early roads uh, are not what we think of as roads. They were usually just dirt tracks that got widened by constant use by wagons and horses, and so it was really pretty difficult traveling. Now, in some places, people got permission from the state to build what they would call a turnpike, and sometimes they were just uh, improved roads that had been graded and maybe had some gravel on them. Uh, sometimes they were corduroy roads, which were logs laid next to each other to provide a, a solid surface. Uh, probably not very comfortable to ride on, but better than the mud. And if you built a turnpike, then you needed money to maintain it. So people quite often got permission to charge tolls on their roads. Um, so you'll hear about the Reisterstown Turnpike or the uh, Meadow Branch Turnpike, and these were not very long roads, but you'd find a toll, ro toll house at each end. And usually they charged you so much for uh, how many horses you were bringing on it or the size of your wagon. And a lot of that was because of the damage that your vehicle would be doing to the road. So um, while it was nice, just like today, people have a choice of paying to take the toll road or taking the free road, um, it was a good way to get improved roads. Kind of moving on to business and industry, uh, <clears throat> a lot of hardships and successes. <coughs> Excuse me. Do you want to talk at all about just as a brief introduction or anything about any of the mining and the iron furnace? While most of the early settlers in Carroll County were farmers of some sort, um, there were also some who came for other natural resources. There were copper deposits, iron deposits. Uh, and other minerals, including limestone and uh, marble in various parts of the county, and people came to establish mines that would quarry these, and there were even some foundries established to do the processing of some of those materials. Great. Uh, <clears throat> just describe briefly how the county's, uh, the county's communities cooperated together to create a strong agro-commercial uh, economy. Uh, flour and grist mills, wheat and flour exports, canneries, and then kind of an 1840s census that had corn as the leading crop. Carroll County really relied on its agricultural crops as the basis of its economy, and not only in creating the crops, but then other industries grew up that took advantage of those agricultural products. Uh, mills grew up that could convert the grain crops into flour that could be shipped off to Baltimore and from there out around the world. Canneries grew up around the county in places like Silver Run and Westminster and Mount Airy and New Windsor uh, that could process those things that could then be shipped to urban markets throughout the county or the country and uh, became world famous uh, by the 20th century. Uh, B.F. Shriver products were being shipped to all over the world, and in fact, uh, there, we once met a World War I soldier who remembered being in a trench in France and being handed a can of Shriver corn as part of his daily ration and sat there and said, this is from my home. Uh, so we became well known for our agricultural products, and even some of these mills grew up not just to handle the local market, but specifically to deal with the international market. Uh, up at Union Mills, the Shriver Mill always intended to be a commercial operation to create large quantities of flour that could be shipped to Baltimore and then on to other areas. Some of these milling operations really became the center of a small community and the Union Mills area was a perfect example. The Shrivers began with a mill uh, and greatly expanded their operation over the years, and some of that was to support their business. They built a cooper shop to build the barrels that they would need to ship the flour. 
Uh, they had a tannery that could produce the things that they needed to operate the mills and work on the belts and the other parts of that. Uh, but they also became the center of a real community for their workers. They had a post office right in the homestead at Union Mills. Uh, there were churches that grew up in that area, all to support that. And it really became its own little industrial complex, um, far enough away from Westminster at that time uh, that it was a day's journey to Westminster, and it became its own independent community. Um, why do you think Union Mills is uh, basically still in pristine condition, still on the map, as it were, uh, where so many other early mills are either totally gone or just a ruin? We're quite lucky, actually, to have Union Mills in such good condition. Uh, most of the mills throughout Carroll County have deteriorated out over the years when they went out of business and their owners abandoned them and the property was allowed to deteriorate. Luckily, the Shriver family has taken a strong interest in Union Mills, and it remained in Shriver family hands for several generations. Uh, the last people to live in the homestead uh, were well into the middle of the 20th century and took care of the mill. And they have now created a not-for-profit, the Union Mills Homestead Foundation, that supports the mill and makes sure it survives. And it's a, a wonderful example because there aren't any other places in Carroll County where you can see a grist mill operate, where you can really understand that early 19th century technology and how leading edge it really was. Great. Um, going back one step, that um, I don't think I heard you say it, but the, uh, it was another first for Carroll County, uh, that they were uh, the first county in the world for canned corn. Our agricultural products really did become very important and uh, Carroll County was very proud of it and we have a, a wonderful photograph in our collection at the Historical Society uh, showing a float that Carroll County put into the parade to celebrate the opening of the Severn River Bridge. Every county in the state sent a float. Um, our representative has a big banner on it that says Carroll County, number one in the world in production of canned corn. Um, and the float is fun because there are stacks of cans of corn on there. Uh, they also bragged about our leading production of swine. And our third product at that point was Congolium. So we sort of covered the gamut. By that time, we did have some manufacturing. And so we're, we love that photograph. We use it quite often, uh, our examples of swine, con cream corn, and Congolium. The National Road passed through Mount Airy. Um, was that on the Carroll County side? Carroll County did get one advantage in transportation when the National Road came through. It doesn't cover much of Carroll County. Um, but it did literally put us on the map and increase our connection uh, to some of the major cities and also opened up transportation to the west, which meant that our people could move west easily and also we could ship products further west. Um, the Vienna Railroad was established in 1828. Um, it was 1831 the first time that the train came to Carroll County uh, to Sykesville and then went on to Pars Ridge and maybe included a little Tom Thumb story in that. Okay. Uh, the first railroads in Carroll County were down on the southern part of the county. When the B&O Railroad expanded beyond Baltimore on its way west, uh, it reached Carroll County in the early 1830s and it came through what is now Sykesville and along the southern part of the county all the way to what's now Mount Airy. Um, where it actually had quite a challenge climbing the steep incline at Pars Ridge. It was quite a technological feat for them uh, to develop all of the switchbacks that would allow them to climb that ridge. So they built shops at both Sykesville and Mount Airy to service the trains. And so the earliest railroads are actually down away from the county seat, down in the southern part of the county. <clears throat> and, then, and then when the railroad was established along that southern route, um, how did it affect travel on the National Road and um, any other roadways? Um, and how did that affect businesses and towns that had grown up along the way? Having the B&O Railroad come through the southern part of the county was really a great asset for that area because it was much easier to ship your products out. So you tended to have growth of mills. There were paper mills, uh, agricultural mills, 
Some of the copper mines and iron foundries down in that part of the county now found that they could ship iron ore out much easier, and it really was a boost to their business. Um, and it also made it easier for them to get workers into this area. They could come by train, and uh, it was easier to attract people to that area in the county. One of the local, many of the local residents uh, supported the alms house. They donated items like clothing for some of the inmates. Um, they helped take care of them when there were illnesses. And uh, one of them who did that was Mary Shellman, who was active in a lot of different events here in Carroll County. And she used to go out to the almshouse every Christmas and bring food and gifts for the inmates. Uh, she also took an interest in some of the Civil War veterans who were living there, who some of them were, had not quite recovered from the war. They were ill and couldn't work. Uh, they ended up living there and uh, she helped take care of them, took a great interest in them. Um, and actually she bought a lot in Westminster Cemetery and when five of them died at different times, um, she made sure that they got buried in Westminster Cemetery um, with graves marked with honors and so that they would always be known as Civil War veterans. The Civil War years were difficult for Carroll County. Um, as we've talked about, it was a slave area, and there was also anti-slavery feelings here in the county, so you did have divided loyalties. Um, some people thought that we should have seceded. Others were in favor of staying with the Union. And we did have soldiers from Carroll County join both the Union and Confederate armies. So it was a difficult time. You had families that did have sons on both sides, such as the Shrivers up at Union Mills, who had sons in the Union and Confederate armies. So it was a very difficult time here. A lot of troops passed through here, three different campaigns. 1862, 1863, and 1864, we saw troops from both armies here in Carroll County. And it was a very tense time. What was uh, the, the draft, or explain the draft and the exemption fever? While Lincoln's call for volunteers brought in many recruits to the Union Army, it wasn't quite as many as were needed. And unfortunately, they did begin a draft uh, to try to get more people into the Army. This was not necessarily a popular move, and <laughs> Many people did object to this. There were ways to buy your way out of the army. You could hire a substitute to take your place. And it was seen as somewhat of a favoritism to the upper class because it was usually the uh, rich young sons of urban families who could afford to buy their way out. But there were people in Carroll County who bought their way out. And we do have in our collection some documents from a family where someone got a draft notice uh, then we have his certificate from being inducted. Then we have the receipt where he paid his exemption bounty, and then we got his discharge. So uh, it did happen here in Carroll County. It wasn't just necessarily the wealthy who were able to buy their way out of their military service. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, you can, or you could hire a substitute to take your place. <laughs> and there were people who were hired as someone's substitute and then they would desert and then they'd go and use a different name and get hired as someone else's substitute and they were making a pretty good living going into the army and getting back out. You know? um, <clears throat> to, uh, briefly again, how um, the, the brother versus brother with William and Andrew, um, how unusual was it uh, just because William was a southern sympathizer who owned no slaves, Andrew was a northern uh, for the Union and um, actually owned a few slaves. It does seem contradictory that up at Union Mills, the Shrivers who were Union supporters were the slaveholders, and the ones who were Southern sympathizers were not slaveholders. But not everyone in the South had slaves, and many of those who were not slaveholders um, weren't necessarily fighting the war for slavery. They were fighting for what they felt was their state's rights. That became a big phrase. Um, but there were also loyal slaveholders who thought that slavery should be legal. It was legal in Maryland, um, and in fact was legal throughout much of the Union at that time period. And so while it seems like a contradiction, um, and they weren't typical, they were not totally an unusual family. And the sons did as well, the sons fought as well on opposite side? The Shriver family was typical of one that was divided because David Shriver served with an infantry unit in the Union Army, while his cousin Mark served with a cavalry regiment in the Southern Army. 
And this briefly describe the story that you told me of the Niels family. Uh, you know, One of the interesting stories uh, here in Westminster was of the Neal family. Uh, Abner Neal had been mayor of Westminster and his home was right on Main Street and he had two sons and his two sons went off and joined the Southern Army when Colonel Rosser's cavalry regiment was here in 1862 um, they went off with him to join the Southern Army. The following year they returned at the head of Jeb Stewart's column when he came to attack, well actually on his way to Gettysburg. And the family story is that his mother, it was a Sunday, and Mrs. Neal and her daughter were sitting in their parlor reading the Bible when they heard a commotion out in the street. Mrs. Neal put a bookmark in the Bible and went out onto the balcony to see what the commotion was and coming up Main Street were her two sons leading Jeb Stewart's column and she and her daughter waved to them um, and watched the whole column pass. That was the last time she ever saw her sons. They both survived the Battle of Gettysburg and wanted to come home at the end of the war, but she warned them that maybe they should wait a little while because feelings were still very strong and she wasn't quite sure it would be safe for them. Um, one of the sons moved west and she never returned home and another one died just a few years later and so she never saw them again. Now her Bible that she was reading that day is still in the Neal family and they tell me that the bookmark has never been moved from the place where she put it on that day. And was it true also that she, she ended up caring for two Union soldiers and buried one of them? Yes, an interesting footnote to the Neal story is that Mrs. Neal's niece had married a man who was going to become a Union general and he was wounded on the first day at Gettysburg and she ended up with General Gibbon, her, her niece's husband, and also General Hancock staying in her home. He had also been wounded and so she had two wounded Union generals in her house while her sons were fighting for the Southern Army. Many of the wounded from Gettysburg were brought back down the Littlestown Pike to, Pike to Westminster. Say it again. Many of the wounded from Gettysburg were brought back down the Littlestown Pike to Westminster. Uh, they were cared for in temporary hospitals here and then eventually put on trains and taken back to Baltimore to more large permanent hospital facilities. One of the wounded who came back here was Colonel Paul J. Revere, grandson of Paul Revere. He was cared for at the old Main Court Inn, which stood at the corner of Main and Court Streets in Westminster, uh, and unfortunately he died there on July 4th, just hours before his family arrived to visit him. Uh, about 100 free blacks and manumitted slaves in the county were enlisted in the U.S. Colored Troops. Uh, did they fight here, or were they sent elsewhere? A number of... Uh, Blacks from Carroll County enlisted in what were called the U.S. Colored Troops. Um, there were regiments from Baltimore as well, and these units were sent further south. Quite often they were given less than prime duties to take care of. They often were uh, building roads, handling supplies, doing support duties. Um, but some of those regiments eventually do see combat, and uh, there were honored soldiers from Maryland. Uh, in fact, I know there was one from Baltimore who won the Congressional Medal of Honor for his service. There was a soldier from New Windsor named Simon Murdoch who served with the U.S. Colored Troops um, and was wounded. Um, he did survive and uh, later pictures show him very proudly standing in his GAR uniform and you can even see the head wound that he received. Um. The owners had submitted papers to claim compensation for the loss of slaves who joined the Union Army. Uh, were they ever paid, and then how were the, uh, those slaves treated when they returned? Many slave owners eventually filed with the government to get compensation for their lost property uh, in the form of their slaves who had joined the Union Army, but most of those claims didn't really go very far, and most did not receive compensation for their slaves. And how were those slaves treated when they returned? After the Civil War, those slaves were free. The 13th Amendment freed them, and they came back as free men. Some people welcomed them, um, others didn't. 
Um, and so I think there was probably not a universal reaction to people when they came home. But many of them were very proud of their service and did join Grand Army of the Republic posts. Um, that was the Union Veterans Organization. And in fact, the Stevens Post here in Carroll County had many African-American members who joined. One of the interesting stories uh, about African-Americans in Carroll County has to do with a man named Sebastian Boss Hammond. He was born a slave, and we're not quite sure who taught him, but he learned how to do stone carving. And his owner, which was very typical, would use his labor to make money. He would have Boss doing stone carving for other people, and then the owner would keep the profits from that. But he apparently let Boss keep some of the money as well because Boss eventually saved up enough money to purchase his own freedom. And he settled uh, in the area near New Windsor, and we know that he quarried his own stones and did all his own stone carving. And you'll find his tombstones all over that area around New Windsor. They're quite distinctive in style. And it's really amazing because he never learned how to read, and yet he was able to accurately transcribe onto the tombstones uh, whatever wording people wanted. Now, he was quite well known. He bought a lot of property, and eventually he made enough money that he bought the freedom of his wife and all of their ten children. And they were this wonderful family, and their descendants are still here in Carroll County today. And just, I guess, kind of sitting back once, when they, um, they, they were free and they either had land or they had, maybe they had money to buy land or whatever, did they kind of integrate themselves into um, already settled communities or did they kind of have their own community with a church? And... There were a number of uh, black churches in Carroll County and the, even though they were free, uh, they were still not accepted by many members a across the country. Um, it was just a different attitude, and uh, racial attitudes were very different, and so they formed little clusters of settlements around the county, um, founding black cemeteries and black churches. Uh, some of those churches still exist today, but uh, I think we've come a long way towards uh, integrating everybody in the county. Describe in a paragraph. The growth, you know, how did, how did they, did they come back and integrate themselves fairly well? In, did they have to start over? Um, that dairy, livestock, poultry, and all that were major commodities, um, and kind of just go from there. Kind of the growth of, of what happened kind of post-war. The post-Civil War years saw a real growth in Carroll County. The soldiers came back, returned to their farms or their businesses, and uh, we had an economic boom as all of these soldiers came back, began to plant new crops, started new families, schools grew up, towns grew, um, new businesses appeared, there were a lot of foundries and manufacturing plants that sprung up around the county, um, new agricultural products such as worm seed, which uh, became, we became the world's largest producer of worm seed, um, which was used in uh, treating animal illnesses and uh, we're, there were stills all over the county that processed that. Uh, we still were very big in canning, but as it became more mechanized, our products became able to be shipped all over the world, and some of our canneries became world famous. And new products came in in the 20th century. Uh, there were things like the Baltimore Roofing Company, which existed in a town called Asbestos, because they were using asbestos to make fireproof roofing tiles. Um, so we had some interesting products that appeared in the 20th century. Things like the Lehigh Cement Plant, which grows up at Union Bridge and becomes their major employer, uh, is an outgrowth of the smaller quarries that were there taking advantage of the marble. And so we do have major industrial growth in the 20th century. Many of our census records give you a good indication of what's going on in the county, what people's professions are, and in the 1860 census, Carroll County was ranked sixth in the state in industrial production. So um, we're moving somewhat away from our agricultural economy, even at the start of the Civil War. So just a summary on some of the newer mills after the Civil War. Some new industries also appeared in the mid-19th century. Uh, for example, there were paper mills. 
Um, down in the southern part of the county near Morgan Station, there was the large Woodbine paper mill, uh, and there was another big one up in the northeastern part of the county called the Hoffman paper mills. We also saw the growth of textile mills in places like Oakland, um, where they had grown up from the early part of the century, and also some interesting industries like cigar making up in uh, Manchester. Even though by that point there was very little tobacco being produced in the county, there were a number of tobacco factories that appeared in Manchester and provided some support not only to families, but a lot of women and children had employment in those factories. In 1865, the Maryland General Assembly passed a public school law. What exactly did that mean? In 1865, the state of Maryland passed a public school law that now required the establishment of public schools. Up until that time, education had been primarily in private schools and academies um, that required the payment of tuition, and so that did limit the number of people who would be getting a formal education. Uh, the public school law made it available to everyone, and each county would create a school board and open schools. Um, primarily, these were one-room schoolhouses uh, around the county. Many of them look quite similar. It's a brick structure uh, with a gable roof and a bell tower so that they could call the students to class. Um, usually one teacher, uh, an unmarried woman. If you got married, uh, you could no longer be a teacher. Uh, and uh, the students would range in age from, you know, five or six years old. Rarely did they go up to high school age, but maybe they would stay until they were about 12 or 13 years old. So it was really a, a big advantage because now you have a much more educated population than you had before. And the early education for black children, was that mostly done in churches? In the very early years, uh, black children, if they were educated, it might be a school run by a church. Um, with the establishment of public schools, they did open schools for black students, um, but they were segregated schools, and many of them had to travel many miles to get to their school. There were a number of institutions of higher learning in Carroll County. Uh, today, everyone is familiar with McDaniel College, um, but long before it was founded as Western Maryland College, there was the Irving Institute over near Manchester, there was Calvert College, which became Blue Ridge College in New Windsor. Um, there was a college in Union Bridge. So uh, there were many institutions of higher learning that were available to Carroll County residents. And then in the 30s, the Robert Moton Elementary School, um, just explain that one a little bit, or describe that one a little bit. School segregation existed in Carroll County until well into the 20th century. Uh, one of the earliest higher education schools for blacks was Robert Moton High School, which was located in Westminster, and they actually had to bus students from all over the county to the school. It what started out as a very small one-room facility before being expanded to a larger brick multi-room facility, and today there is still a school carrying that name, although it is an elementary school. Let's talk about Mary Bostwick Show. Um, um, just describing her as a prominent member of the community, all of her things that she did. One of the leading citizens in Westminster during the late 19th and early 20th centuries was Mary Bostwick Shellman. Her father was once mayor of Westminster, and he was actually the one who designed the Carroll County Courthouse, and she grew up on Main Street in Westminster. She never married, but she was quite active in all areas of the community's life. She was only 18 years old in 1868 when she answered the call from the Grand Army of the Republic to start a National Memorial Day observance. She gathered local school children and marched them down Main Street out to Westminster Cemetery where they decorated the graves not only of the Union soldiers but also the, of the Confederate veterans. That continues today. Anyone who's attended the Westminster Parade will see all the students from St. John's School carrying flowers and wreaths that they take out to the cemetery and use to decorate veterans' graves. She was also quite interested in other aspects of uh, community involvement. She started the first Boy Scout troop in Westminster. 
Now at that time, women weren't allowed to be involved in the Boy Scouts. It was felt that they were not really suitable to be involved. And to get around this, instead of signing her name, she just used her initials, M.B. Shellman. And she started a troop. She only had a small handful of boys when she started, uh, but she did all, followed all the rules, submitted all the paperwork, um, and it wasn't until a couple of years later that somebody actually told one of the scouting officials that M.B. Shellman was actually Mary Bostwick Shellman. At that point, they told her she could not be associated with her troop anymore, that she really wasn't qualified, uh, and she was believed to have made some uh, rather telling comments about how qualified were they if it took them that long to figure out that she was a woman. So uh, she unfortunately did lose her troop, but she never lost her interest in children and in education. She actually started a literary newspaper in Carroll County. She called it the Amphion's Journal, and she would publish poetry and stories. Um, unfortunately, it didn't really seem to find much of an audience, and it didn't last very long, but it was an interesting attempt at a, a literary journal for that time period. Uh, she was also the first telephone operator here in Carroll County. The first telephone in the city of Westminster was on the second floor of her home at 206 East Main Street, and her switchboard was there. Um, and she even got a visit from Alexander Graham Bell, who showed up early for his meeting and found her still at work, um, wearing, she had cuffs that she wore to protect her dress and keep it clean. Um, and she said that was the badge of the telephone operator was the cuffs that they wore. He felt she deserved something better and he actually sent her a miniature gold telephone pendant. Uh, said that was a better mark of the telephone operator. And uh, that pin still exists. It's in the collection at the Historical Society. So she was quite an interesting lady. Rural free delivery. Uh, just describe uh, the first uh, RFD system. Uh, first, and it was another first for the county. Um, yeah. It was at Edward Shriver, the day post office on wheels. Okay. Carroll County is uh, very proud to be the first county in the country that had countywide delivery of mail right to your door. Uh, the idea of rural free delivery of mail was quite a, a novel idea, and people weren't really sure that they liked this. Um, most of the times you picked up your mail at perhaps a general store, or for example, the Union Mills Homestead had a post office there and everybody in Union Mills had to go pick up their mail. These business owners were quite concerned that if you didn't have to come in every day and pick up your mail, you wouldn't come in quite as often and buy from their store. So there was some opposition to the system. But in the 1890s, the Postal Service did some test routes in counties around the country, including Carroll County, and decided that this really was a very good thing to do. So in 1899, they came up with a number of routes and assigned the postmasters to go out and make their circuit every day, delivering mail to people and picking up the mail. To help them on their routes, they devised what was called the post office on wheels. And one of the designs for this was done by Westminster's post office, Edwin Shriver. Uh, it was a specially designed wagon uh, that had all the various cubby holes and compartments that you needed to sort the mail as you went along your route. And it could be pulled by one horse. And the postmasters would set out every day and cover a route of 10 to 20 miles, uh, a circuit through their system, and hand out the mail to everybody. Now, eventually people realized that this was a good idea. And today, I think people would be shocked at the idea that they had to go to the post office every day if they wanted their mail delivery. Also, in addition to the the merchants wanting you know people to come in to buy whatever, was one of the post office at that point a very uh, place of social uh, visits and you kind of come come into town to see your friends and meet at the post office and whatever. Uh, a lot of postal customers were also a little bit worried that they would miss their daily visit with their neighbors because quite often uh, people would gather at the post office, trade news, trade gossip, uh, get to see their neighbors every day and it was a way to get out and socialize. So they were afraid that they would lose some of that with people coming to 
deliver their mail every day. There were also some questions about privacy. And when you brought it to the postmaster, um, you knew it was going right into the mailbag and it would be secure. And there were questions about how trustworthy was the guy who's driving around in the wagon all day with your mail and nobody keeping an eye on him. So it was really quite a novel idea when they came up with this decision to take the mail right from your home. Uh, did Edwin Shriver create the entire system? No, he was involved in promoting it. Um, and Westminster's postmaster, Edwin Shriver, was quite involved in promoting the initial system and devising some of the routes for Carroll County. Um, he kept accurate records as to what some of the routes were and traced their development. Um, and he also designed one of the wagons, um, drew up the blueprints for what he called his post office on wheels. World War One. this will probably be very, very minor, but on the home front, uh, just was it World War One have an impact on the county, loss of men, women taking over jobs, that kind of thing? There were a lot of changes that took place in Carroll County during World War One. Many of the local soldiers, the local Maryland National Guard unit, Company H, uh, was called up for national service. Uh, they started out actually serving on the Mexican border and helping to track down uh, the Mexican bandit, as they called him, Pancho Villa, uh, before they were actually called back and shipped overseas to France to s finish out their service. Uh, many local women took their jobs in the factories and also did war work with the Red Cross, rolling bandages, putting together care packages, um, sending things like that over to the soldiers. Uh, knitting was very big. You could get patterns on how to knit regulation sweaters and socks to send overseas to the soldiers. Uh, and many local industries started producing things for the war effort. Uh, Shriver Cannery produced a lot of canned goods that were shipped overseas to the soldiers. And uh, one World War I veteran uh, remembered being in a trench in France and being handed a can of Shriver corn as part of his daily ration. Um, transportation, uh, at that point in the early 1900s, the horseless carriage changed the face of transportation. How did the uh, advent of the cars and then trucks affect the county's roads um, and shipments of agricultural produce, business, industrial commodities? Um, and then also how did the car affect the railroad? The 20th century saw the transition from horses and wagons to the horseless carriage, cars and trucks. Um, that made a major impact on the Carroll County just like it did on all communities. The livery stables disappeared from the towns downtowns and were replaced by garages and gas stations. Most of the roads up until the early 20th century were still dirt and were very difficult for cars to travel. So with the coming of the automobile, they had to pave many of the roads. Now Carroll County still has some unpaved roads, but the vast majority now uh, are good solid paved roads. Cars had a problem with winter and ice and mud and snow. Um, heavy rainy seasons could bog them down. So you see a, a large infrastructure investment. The development of the automobile also allowed companies to ship their products much easier. Uh, many of the local factories had railroad sidings from the main lines right into their factory for the loading and unloading of goods, but that was a fairly expensive expenditure. With trucks, um, there wasn't much infrastructure that you needed other than a loading dock to be able to ship things in and out. But it did require good roads to Baltimore, and many of the roads in and out of Baltimore were improved. And this also allowed new people to move into the county. It was now not a full day's journey to get to Baltimore and back, and people could start to go there for entertainment, uh, shopping, go to the movies, um, but they could also work in Baltimore and live in Carroll County. And you started to develop uh, bedroom communities for Baltimore and Washington out here. In the 1950s, uh, traffic had improved to the point where we needed a bypass. And so they completed Route 140 from Carroll County to Baltimore. And Governor McKeldin came out. There were big ceremonies, ribbon cuttings, and the big celebration that we now had a good connection to the city of Baltimore. And then how did that affect the railroad again? Did it, cause its, it didn't cause its demise, but it, did it certainly uh, change the use of railroads? And 
Railroads in general throughout the 20th century saw a decline as trucks and cars replaced railroads for commercial shipping and for passenger traffic. Uh, railroads saw their business decrease dramatically. Passenger service to most of the communities in Carroll County ended during the middle of the century and freight was drastically reduced. Um, today there are still some freight trains that pass through Carroll County but I don't believe that they stop at any of the Carroll County communities anymore. And it really attracts people's attention when they do hear a train. It's gone from being a uh, commonplace to being a rarity. Okay. Um, kind of a miscellaneous question that I threw in there. Uh, prohibition in 1916, how did it affect the county is obvious, but was it a big deal here, like it might have been in Baltimore? Prohibition was an interesting period in American history. and. Um, there were political campaigns for many years, are you wet or are you dry? And Carroll County was divided. Um, many of the churches were strong proponents of prohibition. Um, there was a temperance union and Mary Bostwick Shellman was quite active in the temperance movement. Um, there were big rallies, they would have signs that would say, um, it's evil, we're in favor of this. Uh, or sometimes uh, we've even seen ones that said, we mean to conquer. Uh, and in fact, there was a temperance society in Tawnytown um, and an offshoot of that one because they said the people in the original temperance society weren't actually temperate enough for them and they were going to start their own temperance society. The women's suffrage um, kind of extension groups provided the county uh, women with a chance to become involved in politics. How did the men respond or the county respond to women all of a sudden becoming active? Women's uh, suffrage was a big issue in the early 20th century. Here in Carroll County, a group of local women formed what they called the Just Government League as early as 1913. Uh, their president was Mary Shellman. Um, this was another one of her causes. Uh, and uh, she led her group. They met every month. Uh, there would be reports of their meetings in the newspaper. Their minutes would be published. Uh, and they were really trying to push to get the right for women to vote. Uh, they actually had some of the local men who were on their side, um, or at least saying they were on their side, uh, and were helping to push this suffrage movement through. It was the Just Government League. Okay. Um, the 1937 centennial celebration. Um, just briefly describe how the county celebrated. Um, I don't know how important the Dor Dorothy Elder Dice was organized the uh, the pageant, um, the community players, um, the exposition you had mentioned at the end. In National Guard, parades, et cetera, et cetera. Carroll County was, has always been quite proud of its history. And in 1937, the county threw itself just one fabulous birthday celebration uh, to celebrate its centennial. There were parades uh, with floats from businesses all over the county. There was a huge, as they called it, industrial exposition at the National Art Garment. There was a huge industrial exposition at the National Guard Armory in Westminster, and local businesses each got to create booths that showcased their products. Uh, one of the fun ones was the one from the Congolium factory where they uh, put Congolium flooring down and covered the whole booth with their products so everybody would not make a mistake as to what they made. There was a huge pageant called A Caravan of History, written by Dorothy Elderdice, uh, that covered all of the major aspects of Carroll County history. It was presented at Hoff Field at Western Maryland College um, and had a, literally a cast of thousands who were all costumed to play the roles of the leading citizens of Carroll County history. Uh, I'm not quite sure who was left to watch it. There were so many people in the cast, but they just celebrated for weeks and had a wonderful time. There were band competitions and all kinds of events that went on. Uh, okay, the Great Depression. Um, again, Carroll um, had diversified agricultural industries, a sense of community. Um, so how hard was it hit during the Depression? Um, Robert Ruger in his middle temperament kind of mentioned that Things didn't really shut down per se, but some things closed, some things changed hours. Just kind of describe Carroll County and the. 
The Great Depression was difficult on everyone. Um, a lot of families, husbands were losing their jobs, um, new students coming out of high school couldn't find jobs, but Carroll County wasn't as hard hit as many areas. Um, many of the farms were able to subside, subsist on what they grew. Did that one start, many, of the many of the farm families were able to subsist on what they grew. Uh, they might not have had as much ready cash as they would have liked, but at least they weren't starving. Uh, many of the local factories reduced their hours, um, com cut back on employment a little bit, but we didn't have the general huge unemployment that a lot of areas seem to have. Uh, the, the CCC took um, 32 young men from the county to work. Um, county provided them with food and board and sent a uh, small spending allowance, gave their families an additional $25 a month. Yeah, that was part of a federal program, the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, a number of young men in the county joined what was called the Civilian Conservation Corps. Um, that provided income for them, job training for them, and some income for their families and created a lot of good public works. Uh, many of the men in the Civilian Conservation Corps uh, worked on projects such as the Blue Ridge Parkway, and others uh, worked on what were called WPA projects, the Work Progress Administration, which built things like the old post office on Main Street in Westminster. Um, in 1934 also, all of those, the CCC, CWA, PWA, um, true, I guess it's kind of a true or false. They greatly reduced the relief roles in Carroll County because they were hiring. A lot of these federal programs, and this was a, a very radical idea, was the idea of government coming up with job programs to help get people off unemployment and to provide them not just with money but with jobs that would provide them with training and also be of benefit to the society. And the relief roles in Carroll County, as in many places, were reduced thanks to these federal programs. Um, World War II, I had a typo, I had World War I again, but World War II in the home front, again, just describing how that affected Carroll County, loss of manpower, women supporting the war effort, um, maintaining the home front. World War II was uh, a major event in all the communities of, the, of our country, and Carroll County was no different. Uh, hundreds of men left to go serve their country, and women had to take their places, not only in offices, but in factories, running the homes, taking care of businesses. Um, high school graduates knew that they would be coming out of high school and going off to serve their country. Many of the high school yearbooks have poems talking about that or talking about what it was like to be home with gas rationing, food rationing, blackouts, uh, civil defense drills. And it was quite an exciting time in our country's history and really everyone in society was affected by that. One of the aspects of Carroll County's World War II history that many people are not familiar with is the Heifer Project, where cattle and other farm animals were shipped over to Europe and given to families who had really lost everything in the war, and this was a chance to get them started. And so the seafaring cowboys of Carroll County became known internationally. Just talking about the growth spurt, um, you've already done the highway, but as far as agricultural business and industry, kind of how everything really kind of exploded it from the 50s after the war, uh, up, take it up to 1987 for now, and okay. kind of move on after that. Uh, in the years after World War II, uh, Carroll County's population really exploded. Veterans came home. Um, built new houses, started large families, uh, new people moved into the county with better transportation systems, um, and more and more workers came to the county and worked in places like Baltimore or Washington. But new industries also came in. Agriculture um, is not as important to the economy as it might have been in the 19th century. Many of the early mills had closed down as milling became more centralized and more commercial. But newer industries moved in, such as Random House, book distribution, and uh, the Lee High Cement Plant has expanded tremendously and is now one of the world's largest producers of cement. And other industries appeared in Tawnytown, places like Shelter Systems, which provides um, housing stock and housing equipment. Just as far as agriculture, there was a shift, like you, you sort of mentioned that, but there was a shift from farming and manufacturing to more of a service-based 
in that sense. The county's economy has also shifted it in general to a more service-based economy. Um, our colleges have grown. McDaniel and Carroll Community College have become major employers. Uh, the Springfield Hospital was a major employer. Um, but you won't find as many people listed as being farmhands or being in real manufacturing industries anymore. And today, dwindling farms, uh, I mean, obviously there are, I have to say half, because I don't know what the statistic is. Yeah, but, I don't know, you know either. Development and growth, you know, a lot of those family farms are right. disappearing. Today, many of the agricultural lands are disappearing. Housing developments are growing up. Uh, shopping centers are coming in, and many of the agricultural buildings, the old mills, the barns, all of those types of structures are starting to disappear from our landscape. We hope that many of them will survive, but many of them are in danger right now. Um, business and industry, you mentioned Random House, Black & Decker, I don't know. That's the one, Black & Decker, yep. Um, kind of along with that, um, the uh, today kind of the light industry, uh, business parks, big box stores, all that kind of growth has brought new people in to work in those places. Today new industries are providing employment for Carroll County's residents. Many work in what we would call service industries. They work at stores, uh, offices, they work in places like Walmart and the support businesses for the housing developments that are growing up around here. Uh, Carroll Hospital Center is a major employer now, and many people work in law offices and banks that help support the people who have moved into the county. Today we're also seeing what we would call industrial parks with smaller businesses in them. Large manufacturing plants are not being built as quickly as smaller industries, light industries. Do you think that would ever come back to a need to go back to this you know, farming would ever make a comeback, in other words, as things like the gas prices and trucking produce in and becoming local wars and, and things like that. Do you think farming would ever make a comeback in that sense or, or not? Today, farming is still part of our economy. It's not the major part that it once was, but our farmers' markets are thriving and we're known for them. People come from all over to them. Um, we have some interesting crops. Um, there are people who are raising um, buffalo and bison for the beef market, and uh, we're still a major producer of uh, what we would call truck farming vegetables. So it, luckily our agricultural heritage has not completely disappeared, and it is still holding on um, fairly strong in some areas, and uh, hopefully it will be able to survive well into the 21st century. Um, 4-H, just along with the agriculture, 4-H has been, from whenever it started, it's still going very strong with our ag, you know, agricultural fair. Just maybe a brief description of the 4-H program. Uh, we still have a very strong 4-H program. Young people are learning to farm and to care for animals. Our county 4-H fair is a major event in the county every summer with events like the world famous cake auction that brings in thousands of dollars to support education programs. So I think the seeds are being planted for the future that we do have some young farmers coming along in Carroll County. And last but not least, we'll be describing the 1987 uh, Bicentennial Celebration. Carroll County also celebrated its 150th anniversary in 1987. Um, it wasn't quite the huge event that we had in the 1930s, uh, but I think people were very proud that their first 150 years in Carroll County had been so successful. And uh, there were many celebrations. They even produced a book with the title The First 150 Years um, so that everyone would be able to share in celebrating Carroll County's heritage. I mean, if somebody came in from out of town or something and just said, well, you know, I'm thinking of moving here, you know, what's the county like? Carroll County, I think, is a, is a great place to live. It has wonderful small communities that each have their own identity. Um, the people in Tawnytown are very proud of Tawnytown's history, uh, as are the people in Sykesville proud of Sykesville's history. And we have good schools. We have a, a wonderful educational system, um, lots of good history here, lots of wonderful historic buildings. And I think uh, people should be very lucky if they moved into Carroll County. 
how, how do you see it? Because you know all the history and all the background, how do you see Carroll County in the future? Say another 50 years down the road or whatever. Oh, I'll get out my crystal ball. Um, I think Carroll County is very proud of its heritage and is working very hard to preserve it. And so I think that newcomers to the county are learning about that history and becoming part of the communities. Uh, and I think that down the road, Carroll County is going to continue that dedication to its history and uh, future generations will have lots to learn about what went on here in Carroll County.